Dating and avoidant can be painful. Dating and avoidant is painful. If you want to give yourself in the relationship, if you want to build something with that person, it's very difficult. And in this video, as a former avoidant, but also as a therapist, I want to spend a bit of time with you discussing about that pain. But not only about discussing, but also figuring out ways to feel better. Whether you want to get back with your avoidant partner, whether you want to build a healthier relationship with avoidant partner, whether you want to get rid of avoidance in your life, I will explain everything that you need to do if you want to move forward. So what loving an avoidant means? I'm going to start with a, a quote from the book Attached from Dr. Levin and Dr. Heller. What avoidance creates, the dynamic of a relationship, is emotional disconnection. And when you think about it, when you want to be in a relationship, in a healthy relationship, the only thing that matters is how can you create emotional connection. And so when we can't get this emotional connection, what happens is that we are triggered. Uh, we are triggered because that's triggering an attachment wound around our fear of abandonment. So if you have an anxious attachment style, you have this rooted fear of abandonment. And so when your partner decides to, I need some space, I don't want to discuss those things, um, I need my time alone, that triggers unconsciously this attachment wound. And when it does, it's very easy to be, to think or have this narrative, this story in your head about your worth. If they reject me, if, for instance, they dismiss that conversation, they don't care. If they don't care, it's because I'm not good enough for them. And this dynamic sometimes will create a push-pull uh, dynamic with avoidance where you want closeness. You what we call have protest behaviors. So you would yell, you would cry, you would just want them to react. But by doing that, what you are doing is you are deactivating their attachment. And their protective mechanism, the way they feel safe, is by disconnecting. Is by leaving the room, is by leaving that situation. Okay, and you're always like on this push pull dynamic. And if you, for instance, broke up with your partner recently, most of the time it's because of that. It's because you created that loop of push pull without managing to make it stop, or maybe having a se several loops in the past, and that will sort of stretch the relationship too much that at the end it breaks because the other one feels I can't deal with this. And you might hear things like, it's not working. I love you, but it's not working. Which is a very good sign because it means if it's something that is not working, something I can, you can repair. Another element of loving and avoidance is when you have those unmet needs, um, you're confused, you're frustrated, right? And what we discussed about the protest behaviors. I want to give all myself to you. I want to invest in a relationship. I want to make plans for us in the future. And if you dismiss that, I feel frustrated. I feel it's a one-sided thing. So the, the element of what I want you to understand is obviously awareness and knowing about that attachment style will help. And that's why I'm making videos. Most of the time when I start thinking about a script and writing a video, I'm thinking like, how can I impact people so they have enough insight to feel better right away and have the right piece of information to take the right action. But the problem is that in a lot of cases, knowing is not enough because you have those unconscious mechanism around your attachment system that keep those unmet needs at the forefront of your mind. And this is why sometimes we dwell on the past. We overthink and so on and so on. And because it's an automatic process, we feel that we're helpless, we lack control, because it's the, um, in neuroscience, we call it system one brain, the automatic part of our brain, which is extremely powerful. And it is the one that is activated when we are triggered. When you watch this video, when you listen to my content, it's a system two brain listening, the rational part of the brain, which is smarter in the sense of analyzing information, but slower in terms of processing power. And so the point, what you have to do is to try to embed that knowledge 
and gain more awareness about what's going on in the background. That's what we do in therapy, basically. So why is that so powerful? As I discussed, we have the system one, system two brain. I just uh, introduced a quote from uh, John Bowlby, who was the father of attachment theory. And back in those days, um, they didn't talk about brain as system one, system two. I think the concept, this concept came after with Daniel Kahneman. Um, but he said, attachment is wired for survival. Emotional bonds f- feel crucial. It's kind of another need that you have in your Maslow pyramid. I need connection at all costs. And if you think about it from a survival point of view, biological point of view, you need it to be attached to someone in order to survive back in the days. Being in group, being with a mate, was part of, uh, you know, almost in our DNA. We need food, we need shelter. We also need to have kids reproduce. And for that, we need to be attached to someone. And so this idea of like, he or she rejects me, triggering this survival mode. Um, And so avoidance, what they do, they don't know that they are doing it, but what they do is that they activate your anxiety around that. You feel insecure, right? It's as if I would take away food, water, or shelter from you. Or you're thinking that they will take away food, shelter, etc. It's like a primary need that he or she is taking away from you. And so obviously, the more you pull away, if I take something from you, if I tell you you're not going to eat for a week, of course, you're going to sort of (laughs) jump at your fridge and eat whatever you want, whatever you can. And so what will happen is those dopamine rushes that you get when they are close to you, because otherwise you wouldn't have a relationship with them, that creates a message like, ah, there's potential. I want this. And then they deactivate. I want this, and then they deactivate. And it's always this again, roller, what I call the roller coaster effect that um, most anxiously attached people are prone to is that I really want to experience the highs of the relationship, and because the highs are very high and the lows are very lows, I feel addicted. That's actually how you create addiction: is creating very high highs and very low lows. And when you think about it, like it doesn't make sense because the low lows are very damaging. Again, it's the system one brain; it's not the rational part of the brain. And so what the dynamic of avoidance, while we are sometimes attracted, or you're attracted to avoidance, is this inconsistency. Because somehow it could be also familiar. And looking at your story, looking at your relationship, some people might say, you're wasting your time. Look at everything that he's done or she's done or hasn't done or hasn't invested or hasn't shown. But still you'll be fixated on, yes, but I remember at this occasion, we had this, right? And the, the intensity of this, of this event is based on the difference between the highs and the lows. And so the challenge that you have to, or the things you have to reflect on as well, is if you were to meet someone secure, wouldn't you fall into the trap of like, it's boring because the highs are lower, the lows are higher, but the difference so the, the highs will be la- there and the lows here. The difference, the intensity will be different, will be lower, and you might feel I'm bored. A lot of people sometimes they dismiss secure partners because of that. So again, it's food for thoughts. The idea is to, again to gain that self-awareness. Do a relationship inventory, figure out the patterns. When you do this work, then you can make sense of the situation. What happens is Your anxiety wants resolution. We have a problem. I feel upset. I feel sad. I want us to fix it. I don't want us to split. I don't want us to separate. I want us to discuss this. But it's something you can't get with an avoidance. Because when it comes to intimacy, to vulnerability, they're not comfortable with that. And they will push back. And so that's why sometimes you might end up being in painful or toxic relationship. Not that avoidance are toxic, but you accept being in those situations where you can't get your need, your needs met. And so the point again, the point of this video is to understand those patterns and regain control every single day. It's not going to happen overnight, but the point is like insight, knowledge, self-awareness. And every single day, I want you to reflect and think like, how can I be 
stronger, more secure, more confident than yesterday. If you increase one person every day, the compound interest, I don't remember because I always say <laughs> over a year is like 10, seven times or something like that. So how can I be better tomorrow? Just one person better. How can I figure out like when I'm triggered? Why am I triggered? What should be the response? And maybe 99% of the time you will struggle, but if the one time out of 100 you figure it out and you do that every single day for the rest of the year, trust me, you'll be secure. No question. Um, and I forgot to mention, by the way, if you want to have, have questions about your dynamic with your avoidant partner, I put together an assessment to figure out whether it makes sense to get back, whether you can get back with them. Um, I'll explain towards the end what is the assessment, but have a look in the description. Uh, it's totally free, um, and I created this assessment for you if you dated an avoidant specifically. So let's talk about breakup. If, was, if you're in the context of a breakup, obviously, um, with an avoidant, it's kind of the self-fulfilling prophecy. You fear abandonment, and what they do, they leave you. Um, and so the problem is, throughout the relationship, you might have felt, well, I invested so much. I took, you know, we spent two years, three years, 10 years together. I had plans. The problem with a breakup is you have to let go of the past relationship, but you also have to let go of what could have been. Let go of the commitment that we had, the plans that we had. And it's really, really hard. And the problem is that with avoidance, it seems from the outside that they leave the relationship not hurt, unaffected, and that creates this element of like, was he or she lying to me all that time? Who I was for them? So they leave the relationship, they leave me, they disappear, and I can't feel any sense of remorse or regret or sadness. And I'll tell you why, it's because they are very good at masking things. They are called dismissive avoidance, they dismiss things. So for many years, for me, I couldn't really feel my emotions. And I thought that was a superpower. Because if you don't feel your emotions, you can't really be sad. But in the background, you have lingering feelings. You have things that over time might create a lot of problems, of mental health problems, if you don't process your emotions, if you're not in tune with your emotions. Because emotions are not bad in themselves, they're just a signal signaling you where to go, what, you know, what it means about the situation, your belief system, etc. If you, there's two bad ways to deal with emotions. The avoidance, they will dismiss. They're non-existent. I don't have any emotions. If I don't have any emotion, I can't suffer. Anxious is like, the other bad way to deal with emotions is like, this emotion defines me. I am my emotion. I'm sad, I'm a depressed person. I'm labeling myself with that emotion. They broke up with me, they dumped me, I'm no good. And because I feel this way, I don't feel I'm neither good enough or I'm worthy of love. I'm just a loser and so on and so forth. And so we let anxious people, they will let the emotions drive their well-being and how they see the world. And so what you have to do is to rewire the brain around detachment. There's an element of, and it's a process after a, a, a breakup of taking that step back, readapting your expectations. And we're going to discuss in a second whether to get back or not with an avoidant. I'm not saying that you should move on and never get back or not date any avoidant. I'm an avoidant. <laughs> so it's not that I, I would um, defend the avoidant team. But in a way, it's based on our insecurities. When we are scared of intimacy, it's not because we don't care. It's not because we don't want to be in love. Because again, back to uh, what Bolby said, it's a crucial need that we all have. Dismissive avoidance, they somehow block this essential need. And so breaking up is difficult because you long for what the relationship could have been. Um, I call that the potential fallacy that I discussed in the before is the idea of like, I know he could make me happy. I know she could make me happy. I know we 
could be happy. There's potential there. Maybe that was inconsistent, but I could perceive that there's a way for us to be happy. So you have to let go of that. Really filter in and out. Be really analytical about how you process the emotion, how you process the uh, um, and, and analyze the relationship. And if you need to knock your, pa- your ex from, from their pedestal. The, the problem also is that you usually don't get closure with avoidance. And again, it's not because they don't care, just because they, it's so hard for them to open up, but also to know what to say. Because they will tell you, you will try to get, you know, if, I, if only I could open their brain and figure out what's going on, but they don't even know. Usually they don't even know, they don't even know what to say. And so healing, and we'll discuss in a second, requires you to process that, uh, this element of, of love and frustration of what you had, what you could have had, of the potential and recalibrating things. Because right now, if you broke up with your partner, you don't have the relationship. So there's no point thinking about the potential. You have to go back to here and now. And so how can you heal from that? First of all, I think if there are one value around this video, is like their avoidance, the fact that they left, the fact that they got triggered, by your bid to be close or by any form of commitment has nothing to do with you. So if I were to replace you with someone else in the same situation that you had, he or she would probably have reacted the same way because it's their their attachment style. It feels like they reject me, but they don't reject you. They reject the relationship. And so the recalibration phase is really about, okay, I don't have my partner to soothe me. I don't have my partner to um, discuss emotional things or to comfort me, etc. So it's, it's important for you to focus on how you can meet those needs on yourself. Create space. So you have to go no contact after a breakup. It is extremely important, more from the, from the, the, the front of helping you to heal, helping you to process those things. If you broke up with your partner and you're still in touch with them, you're going to prolong the healing system and you're not going to actually increase any chances of you getting back together. One element, um, and it's a study from Dr. Penbecker, I don't know if I pronounce it <laughs> correctly, um, that if you want to process complex emotions, journaling is one of the best uh, way to do it. So that's why I do it with my clients on WhatsApp. They use WhatsApp as an interactive journal uh, tool, but you can do it on your own. So the point is like, Rather than keeping things to yourself, rather than dwelling on the past, take a piece of paper and write it down. Write it down. Don't think about what you write. Write it down. Um, and if you have any question or any prompt that you need, let me know in the comment section and I will give you some prompt. Another way to heal is to obviously reconnect with um, secure people. This bond that you've lost, this attachment that you've lost, you could also, it's not replace it, but you can, it's, we are social animals. So obviously after a breakup, we, sometimes we want to isolate ourselves, we want to be alone. But the problem is that you fail to understand that you, we thrive on social connection. And what, that's what, what you did right now is just learning more about your situation, but it's also connecting with people. People who care about you, people who value who you are, people who are in your team. Another element as well, if you want to be, have a structured approach, um, and that's from Seagull. Therapy is the most way, the most effective way to rewire attachment response. Again, it's something you can do on your own, but the most effective way is to sit down with a therapist and work through those things. The reason it's more efficient is because it's easier for you to reflect, have a discussion, and also have a structure. It's like anything in life. You can work out, be fit, um, study, etc. Everything, you can do it on your own. But that requires a lot of willpower and structure and, um, and mental toughness, etc. that we usually don't have after a breakup. Um, so for instance, I want to be active. I'm not the most physical person ever. So the way I get, <laughs> I get to be active is I go to classes and to, so I, I need to commit and I have to follow someone and I don't have to think like, what should I do? What should be the exercise, etc. It took me a while to figure out, but now I know I can't rely on myself. <laughs> if I want to work out, so I will join classes and I just have to follow the trainer 
who will shout at me and <laughs> push me to do more one, one more set than what I would do uh, if I were doing it on, on my own. Another element as well is the practice mindfulness, not necessarily meditation, but just again reflecting on the thought process, reflecting on the your anxiety uh, triggers, uh, and shifting the attention from I should have, I could have, what we had, etc., to the here and now. That's the power of mindfulness. Is like, hold on, I have so many intrudi- intrudi- intrusive thoughts. This is why you're anxious. How can I block them? How can I process them? And figure out, like, what do I need now? Like, after watching this video, okay, what do you need now to feel good? Taking a bath, going for a walk, calling a friend, pick what you want. But just like, you can choose, there's many options, many possibilities. So just do it. Stop watching my videos and do it <laughs> But after this video. And now it's very important is rebuilding that sense of security, reshaping your confidence, basically feeling that I can trust myself, I can trust partners. So the idea is to find ways to reaffirm your value outside of the relationship. So sometimes we are, I'm worthy of love, I'm valuable, or I'm confident, etc. because someone loves me. So if someone loves me, that tells me something about my value. That person I feel doesn't love me anymore or rejects me, therefore my value drops. No, I can tell you, you are the same person the day before they broke up with you. You're the same person. Your perception is different, obviously, but you're the same person, fundamentally dif- uh, the same person. Another element as well is, as you try to recover the relationship, is to have strict boundaries. The work that I do with my clients is, yes, trying to get back, helping them to get back with their uh, partners, but before that, is figuring out what you want, what you don't want. What are the things you accept, what are the things you don't accept? Um, and as part of this work, and working at being independent is finding activities. Because sometimes we do, yeah, but I was doing everything with my partner. Yeah, but we had this, those hobbies together. Find something that you could do on your own. If you want to have a healthy relationship, if you want to have a secure relationship, you need to develop what we call an interdependence. And a secure base is a relationship where you have your relationship, but you also have your life. And you can go back and forth whenever you feel the need to explore, the need to challenge yourself, and the need to be reassured. Avoidant, they will lean towards like, I need to explore and I don't need to be soothed. Anxious will be like, I don't want to explore. I'm, I'm fine just there in my comfort zone and I want to stay there forever. So it's time for you to explore a little bit and change yourself. Another element very important is around self-compassion, because sometimes we are telling ourselves the worst things. <laughs> If you ask people to um, say something about you, I'm pretty sure people will tell you good things, right? Most people, if you ask, and it's an exercise that I've done with my clients in the past, when we had um, in our uh, one of our first uh, group coaching uh, um, programs, it's like asking their friends feedback, it's like a 360 feedback. And people will get amazing feedback, some constructive ones, but like 90% of feedback is positive. But if I were to ask you to de- describe yourself, I'm pretty sure it would be the other way around. You'd be like 90% of negative things. Because sometimes, as we want to be the better version of ourselves, we are fixated on the bad. What can I improve? And maybe it's because of our job, maybe because of society, but most people are more focused on what's wrong and what can I fix than what's working. And the problem is that in the context of a breakup, we are fixating on like, it's not working because they broke up with me, they rejected me. So I need to focus on that. No, your healing process starts by figuring out the positive elements, your talent, your skills, what makes you unique, what makes you attractive. And don't think, no, but I'm not attractive. I don't have qualities, no. You're the same person that your partner fell in love with. You know, fundamentally the same person one week, one month before the breakup. So you have those qualities, those assets that you can leverage. And it's very important and it's very nice to remind yourself of those things. So should you get back with your ex? That's a big question. (laughs) First of all, 
it's fine to date an avoidant. Um, I think my wife is happy. <laughs> I think the the thing is what you have to consider is not the attachment style is whether there are signs of personal development, i.e., whether they feel like hmm. I know I have insecurities. I know I have this fear of intimacy. I know I keep things superficial and that's preventing me from being happy in my relationship and in my relationship with you. And therefore I'm working on myself, seeing a therapist or I'm ac- I acknowledge that there's something wrong. That's the first element. And the, the other element, which is, was the relationship truly meaningful? Um, and in, I have another test just assessing this, but I added another um, dimension to this assessment around attachment. Sometimes we are in one-sided relationships and we fail to recognize that it's a one-sided relationship. Sometimes we fall in love and it's very hard to let go of short-term relationships. Like you met your partner for three, four, five months and it's hard to let go. But the question is like, was this relationship really meaningful? Was this relationship in, the context, in, in your ex's mind something that was life-defining? the relationship and we can have more than one the relationship you know what i mean like proper serious relationship where i feel like okay i want to start something with you i want to build something with you so you can have a great relationship with your ex but you have to you need to have those two elements the good thing with breakups is that if you recover from that your relationship will be way way stronger than before 10 times stronger than before but obviously that will require you to work work on your insecurities work at creating a secure base work at communicating more effectively with your partner but also for them to do a bit of work otherwise that would be too easy you don't want to be ending up only the one trying to fix things maybe you need to take the lead maybe you need to show them the way be the role model so that's usually the, the approach that i have with my clients we do the work We show them what it could be, that another relationship can happen, that it doesn't have to be the same dynamic, it doesn't have to be the same push-pull, the same avoidant anxious trap. And once you do that, and you create that new secure base, then they get attracted, because what's left of the relationship is only the positive sides. Um, So it's important to assess those four elements when you reflect on that, whether you should get back with your ex or not. So as I said, I put together an assessment, giving you, letting you which quadrant you're in. Obviously, you want to be in the green one if you want to get back with your ex. So which means that there's a strong willingness for them to change and there's a high potential in the relationship. The yellow is, they have a willingness to change, but they're probably not interested in the relationship. So in those cases, you have to protect yourself, but it's the same way in a way, establishing healthy boundaries from the get-go and and resetting your expectations. Um, The heartfelt but stuck, this is very common, is when you know they love you, but their uh, attachment style is so ingrained and they have this fixed mindset that I will never change. That you have to make the process of accepting that despite that huge potential, despite the fact that they, are, they have had a traumatic childhood, or they have, you know, potentially history explaining this attachment, they are not doing the work. They are not taking it seriously, or at least they are not providing enough results for you to be in a healthy relationship with them. And therefore, acknowledging that I'd rather stay friend with that person and treat them as friends rather than thinking like, oh, there's potential for us to be happy in a future relationship. No, because it might not happen because you've tried. It didn't work out. And the red one is obviously when there's no potential, no willingness to change. And this is where obviously the obvious option is to move on, which is easier said than done and refer back to my other slides on how you can heal because it's the same process. If you want to get back with your ex, you heal first. You understand about your insecurities. You develop that secure attachment style. This way you can better communicate. You can create that secure base with them. If you have any other questions, let me know. If you 
like this video, don't forget to click on the like button, that does help me a lot because that pushes my content on YouTube. And I'll see you next time, take care.